Good morning. My name is Mark Bailey, and I'm happy to be here to present some of the latest advances in rehabilitation of the upwards remedy following stroke. By the end of this presentation, by the end of this presentation, I hope that you should be able to uh, describe a prognostic model of upper extremity recovery after stroke and why it is important to tailor the treatment to the individual. That you'll be able to discuss the benefits of combining approaches to enhance upper extremity uh, recovery and supporting evidence for that, and that you'll describe, we'll be working on uh, showing you some online evidence-based resources that can help clinicians implement upper extremity rehabilitation. I'm going to suggest that to take the most advantage of this presentation, that you go to either the Apple App Store or Google Play or to www.biotherapy.org to download the app to your smartphone or tablet that we'll, we will be using during this presentation. I will ask the presenters to pause for a moment while most of the audience does that. So, why do we care about uh, post-stroke upper extremity impairment? Well, it's because the arm is the most frequently involved in the middle cerebral artery. Territory stroke, which is one of the most common uh, strokes that we observe. Arm function is critical for people to do their safe self-care and other activities of daily living. We know that severe impairment of the arm is more difficult to rehabilitate and is associated with sensory changes and people learn because of the lack of function not to use the arm and that this creates negatively uh, negative effects on recovery. While there's been recently enhancements in acute therapy with endovascular therapy, that can remove clots from uh, middle cerebral artery and other important arteries, as well as the use of early thrombolysis that can uh, bust clots. This has the potential to reduce the severity of stroke, which means that we have less people with a fully paretic arm or fully paralyzed arm and more individuals with arms that are amenable to rehabilitation. Если неврологический дефицит не такой глубокий, пациенту лучше There's a variety of ways in which we measure arm recovery, and I'm going to go through some of the things we think about as we review the evidence for arm recovery. Dexterity is one of the first things that we look at, and this is the ability to use your fine motor or manual skills through a variety of tasks, particularly the hand that's most affected by the stroke. So outcome measures that access dexterity are those that look at tasks that are specific to the fine movements of the hand. Other ways of measuring arm recovery is activities of daily living. These are outcome measures that assess performance in and independence in various everyday tasks, such as dressing yourself or feeding yourself. Spasticity is another uh, problem with arm recovery and measures of spasticity, such as the Ashworth spasticity scale, are measures that look at changes in tone, stiffness, and contractures. We also can look at how well the person has recovered from a range of motion point of view, which examines what is the range they can take their shoulder or arm or elbow through passively and actively. We also know that stroke can negatively affect a person's sensation in their arm and proprioception 
также негативно влияет на способность We would look at global sense of how severe the stroke is. These strokes vary the outcome measures, such as the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, measure the overall severity of one stroke through a global assessment of many different deficits caused by the stroke. And then, of course, we look at muscle strength, which is those outcome measures that assess the muscle power and strength during movement and tasks. So my first objective was to describe a prognostic model that would help you to understand how you might tailor treatment. The rationale is that some of the most difficult questions in rehabilitation are what's this person's potential for recovery and what's the best rehabilitation strategy given uh, this person's why, clinical why profile and recovery in time post-stroke. So to illustrate this point, I will tell you about this random selection of different people following a stroke. This is an example of the different patterns that people can follow. And this is courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Kwaku, from the Netherlands. In this random selection, you can see that the, there are some people who, in this red line, who rapidly recover and, um, and, and continue to do well, getting to an almost fully recovered arm very quickly within a week or two of their stroke. And there are other people who are represented in the green here, who unfortunately do not have any movement of the arm and continue to do very, very poorly. There are very much, there are a number of other different patterns that people may follow in their recovery. They may be delayed for a couple of weeks before they start to recovery. And then there may be some people who, who are doing poorly for as long as six weeks, but yet still continue to make some gains after six weeks. So a lot of people have wondered, how do we measure recovery? How do we know that the person's doing this? And so one of the most common, as I mentioned, one of the most commonly measured tools is called the Action Research Arm Test. This assesses recovery of the upper extremity um, on patients' ability to handle objects differing in size, weight, and shape. It's a 19-item measure divided into four tasks, looking at grasp, grip, pinch, and gross arm movement. Perform performance on each of these items is rated on a four-point scale, ranging from three, which is normal, to zero, which can't do it. And so with these 19 items, it, the score ranges from a score of zero with no function to 57. And the person is observed as they handle objects differing in size, weight, and shape. And there's a kit that comes with this. So this is a study from Nyland and all a game from the Netherlands where they looked at recovery amongst nine hospital stroke units of individuals with a stroke. And they looked at them at very early after the stroke, at 0, 2, 5, 9, 12, 15, 18, and 21 days, to see if they could predict who did well at six months or 26 weeks on the upper limb People who are in this study were diagnosed with a first ever um, hemispheric stroke. They, they had to have had it localized on CT scan or MRI. They needed to be suffering from some form of impairment or paralysis. And they had to be seen within the first 72 hours of the stroke. And, um, they had to have no pre-morbid disability, and they had to be over 18 years of age. So again, this is the random pattern they see for the 91 different people who they measured on the action research arm test. And again, you can see the pattern of some people rapidly getting better. Um, and then you can see the pattern of some people who didn't do well. So, 
которых быстрый, хороший результат в начале, у которых в начале не очень хороший результат. People who had return of voluntary finger extension, which is extension of the finger. And so if people uh, had заметили, um, volun voluntary extension, uh, many, many people did well. And if they didn't have it, they didn't do as well. So here's the thing that you'll notice that in the first 12 weeks, the return of voluntary finger extension, most of the recovery occurred in the first 12 weeks, and most of the lines after this cripple area are flat, suggesting that most recovery occurs in the first 12 weeks. Here's another way. If we're going to figure out when people started to recover. So the 42 people, amongst 42 per people who had return of voluntary finger extension, 40 of them got by 12 weeks. So really, the median time to getting to the maximum is somewhere between four and eight weeks for most of these people. So, this generated an observation by following this group that the prognosis for upper extremity could be determined by looking at a person's shoulder abduction and finger extension within the first days following the stroke. If a person could do both of these activities, shoulder abduction, finger extension, then they would have a good prognosis, and this represented 34% of the people. Whereas if they did not have these, they would be assigned to a, a, a poor prognosis initially. So let's look at some people who got some recovery as measured by an action research arm test score greater than 10 points. So some people, despite the poor prognosis, did have some partial recovery. These people are known as false negatives in that they were not, they were initially thought to be negative, but they actually did better. Whereas there were some people who looked like they were full, but were, um, had a partial recovery. So again, they wondered, okay, if we're looking at shoulder abduction and finger extension, is there any other way of telling who's a true negative versus who is a false negative. So they looked at other things that they examined the people with the stroke. And they found that if you have good uh, lower limb function or leg function, no, uh, no visual spatial problems, no sensory deficit, then you had a 94% chance that you were going to have some recovery. On the other hand, if you were initially not able to abduct and not able to extend your fingers, if you did not have good lower limb function, if you, you had sensory involvement and blocking neglect and so, somatosensory deficit, then you had a 4% chance of getting a good getting any recovery of your arm. So combining shoulder abduction with finger extension and these other aspects of lower limb function, visual spatial neglect, and somatosensory deficit can tell us if somebody's had a very large stroke, which has affected the motor cortex as well as the sensory cortex. This is the this is the area that is included in the middle cerebral artery territory. Therefore, we can, on, with clinical tools, predict who's going to do well and who's not going to. Таким образом, используя простые клинические инструменты, мы можем сделать хороший прогноз относительно восстановления результата. So, let's now look at other measures how we can predict prognosis for recovery of the arm. And this Давайте is work from the Stroke Rehabilitation Roundtable Group, uh, which was published in the International Journal of Stroke. And this group of experts reviewed numerous uh, tests that we could potentially use to measure outcome and that would might predict who's going to do well and who's not. And so they reviewed a number of tests on the left, uh, computed tomography, diffusion tensor imaging, 
uh, T1-weighted MRI, proton density-weighted MRI, electroencephalography, or EEG, magnetic resonance imaging, magnetoencephalography, as well as near-infrared spectroscopy, po positive positron emission tomography, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. And these are the ones that are ready for clinical use. So they found, they recommended that cortical spinal tracts indexed by diffusion tension imaging or by lesion overlap in the hyperacute, acute, early, and late subacute and chronic basis um, has demonstrated a moderate to strong relationship with impairment. So if a person has an intact cortical spinal tract, they will be more likely to recover. Similarly, if you can elicit a motor-evoked potential from by transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation, that means you put a magnetic outside the skull, induce induce a current in the brain, which then travels down to the leg or the arm. If you can find that and it's intact, it is an indicator that the brain is, has the potential to recover. So we have two, a number of tools that are already existing that if we look at a person in the very early days after a stroke, we can predict who's going to recover. So, let's think about how we can improve the outcomes of um, combining rehabilitation with other treatments. So, the idea behind this is that most research is focused on the processes that promote recovery. But we also need a better idea of the things that slow down recovery, the things that make recovery come to a stop. As you saw, at about 12 weeks, things are not looking good. They flatten off. So could we combine something that would allow us to promote ongoing plasticity? So this is a work from my colleague, Dr. Dale Corbett. And what they've looked at is animal models of stroke recovery is uh, the pattern of recovery. You can see that in, in animals, uh, the recovery um, begins and it also plateaus. But we know that there's, during that time, there's an upregulation of growth promoting factors and other peptides and things that may enhance recovery. We also need to wonder, why is it that this flattens out? What's, so there may be upregulation of growth inhibiting factors, so things that slow down the growth. And so therefore, we're wondering, can we find what's slowing down the growth? Let's not just think about what's enhancing the recovery. So we've been looking at the evidence, and this is a reference that I would Мы refer you to, the Evidence-Based Review of Stroke, which is um, now in its 20th uh, first edition. It began in 2001, and what it does is it provides a summary, summary of all the evidence-based in interventions in stroke. It's free, it's comprehensive. And it's up to date uh, and accessible. On, uh, so on it's on been going on for the longest and period of time and has reviewed over 3,500 randomized controlled trials and 3,500 other studies. Interestingly, over 2,300 of those randomized controlled trials are motor interventions, 500 are So for the arm itself, there are over 1,300 randomized controlled trials looking at over 50 interventions. And this provides a critical resource for clinical guidelines from different countries, including Canada. So as we look at all these interventions, um, let's look at those interventions that you might use to augment or add on to therapy-based 
So in our review, we looked at technology-based interventions, such as robotics, brain-machine interface, virtual reality, and EMG biofeedback. We also know that stimulation might be helpful. So we're looking at neuromuscular electrical stimulation, or also known as functional electrical stimulation, in addition to exercise. And we've also looked at the research on thermal stimulation. Furthermore, there's been emergence of what's called non-invasive brain stimulation. This is where the brain is stimulated without invading the brain itself with electrodes and things like repetitive transcranial stimulation and direct current stimulation and magnetic stimulation have been studied to see if it will enhance recovery. And then, of course, there are pharmaceutical which include cerebral license, Botox, serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors, and stimulants, as, as well as L-DOPA. So the next slide shows an interesting analysis that was completed by the team at the Stroke Rehabilitation Evidence-Based Review called a Network Meta-Analysis. Basically, the idea is that if everybody in their studies have used the same outcome measure, which in this case we'll use the Fugelmeyer, which is a measure of upper extremity recovery. If everybody's using the Fugelmeyer, then we can pool all these thousands of studies that have been done, put the data together, and look at different um, combinations as they're compared together. And so if you look at this in this uh, diagram, you can see that there's different things which you can see are in this uh, diagram and to the right-hand side of your screen. And it shows that when we look on the left-hand side, you can see if there's a wide bar, it means there's been more studies and more patients in those studies. And you can see these crossbars also show that where things have been combined, like TENS and EMG or virtual reality and stimulation. So there's where there's some small studies that compared additive things. But by because everybody used the same outcome measure, we can compare the effect sizes for different interventions. So this Network meta-analysis shows that modified constraint-induced movement therapy um, is probably the most potent intervention that can be done, whereas uh, transcranial mag mag magnetic stimulation seems to be helpful. Mental imagery as a therapy, bilateral arm training. And you can see as we go down, you see the most effective treatments that you probably should do first if you have a choice. So, this gives you an idea that we can compare across and we could theoretically combine treatments to get the best outcome. So, let's talk about pharmacological uh, approaches. A number of things have been proposed to help with recovery from a stroke. Um, these are the main ones that have been studied, cerebral and antidepressants, L-DOPA stimulants, and statins. Uh, and these are pharmacological approaches that combine with routine rehabilitation. So, Cerebralisin is one is a, is a treatment that contains low molecular weight neuropeptides and free amino acids, which are believed to have neuroprotective properties, inhibit free radical formation, reduce neuroinflammation, and activate calpain apoptosis. It is delivered by infusion, intravenous infusion, and there are two randomized control trials that compare fibrolysis to a placebo. This is the CARS or Cerebralysin and Recovery After Stroke trial, um, which uh, examined the results of this of the following study. 
Cerebral license was given um, by IV infusion over 20 minutes, once daily for 21 days, beginning at 24 to 72 hours after stroke onset. Was com combined with a standardized rehabilitation program, beginning within 48 to 72 hours of the stroke onset, and it include passive active movements, and the patients also continued <coughs> to 15 minute active movement sessions per week after discharge. So, the primary objective and outcome was the change from the baseline in the action research arm test at day 90. Secondary measures included gait velocity, the nine hole peg test, the NIH stroke scale, the Barthel indicated index, the modified ranking, and the number of communication and neglect scales. And safety was assessed using an adverse event recording. So these are the two trials that have used cerebral lysin for upper extremity motor recovery. There's another trial run by Chang which was also published in 2016 involving 70 people and a larger trial by Mira Seno. Um, and there are some differences between the two trials. The Chang trial gave um, cerebral license for six weeks, whereas the the uh, Murasano trial, uh, um, trial did one time, a day, one time per day for 21 days. And both trials looked at outcomes. Uh, so when we look at these two CARS-1 uh, and CARS-2 uh, trials, uh, it was interesting uh, to see uh, that the two trials recruited a different population when we compare the groups. Uh, uh, the CARS-1 trial um, uh, showed uh, that um, uh, um, it had more people with severe stroke as measured by an action research arm test score of 48.5%. Whereas the CARS-2, which was the Chang trial, had um, a less severe group with only 20% of the population having an IRAT of zero. Similarly, if we look on the NIH stroke scare, which is a global score of severity, you can see that the group in the CARS-1 were more severe. So the question that we raise is, do people with more severe stroke respond better? So this is the analysis, which showed in the trial that um, you can see that in the cerebral group, you have uh, for fifth, almost 15% who had no symptoms at two weeks. Yes, Sorry, we at, at, at 90 days. And you also had a larger group of people with no significant disability. As many as 40% had no significant disability. Whereas in the, the placebo group, this number was less than 20%. So we can see that there was a good improvement in function. This, these groups also did a meta-analysis where they pooled the data. And you can see that on the um, pooled analysis, when you pool the CARS-1 and CARS-2 data, you can see that it still favors um, the 90-day outcome of improved um, recovery on the action research arm test. Similarly, when we use the um, uh, uh, the uh, other outcomes, you can see that it favors, again, the um, cerebral lysin over placebo. When we look at global severity on the NIH stroke scale, you can see that similarly, there's a fi the, the pooled data shows um, an effect size of about 0.6 um, in um, NIHSS changes at day 14 and day 21. So clearly we're seeing an, a signal that this may improve, that this compound will improve outcomes. And interestingly, we're also interested, as I told you, in the impact on neuroplasticity. So um, it was found that in the group that was given cerebral license, 
there was more symmetrical functional connectivity. So what do we mean by that? We mean that, that both sides of the brain had more connectivity in the cerebral lysine group than in the placebo group, where you see that it's more asymmetrical, uh, in this case, uh, less on this side than the other side, which suggests that you have not restored the normal balance between the two hemispheres. And this was statistically significant as well. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, when we review these, we give a rating using the stroke rehabilitation evidence-based review. So the conclusion of the stroke rehabilitation evidence-based review was that uh, cerebral lysis uh, may produce greater improvements in motor function than placebo. This was graded at 1A. Similarly, 1B, it may improve, pr produce greater improvements in activities of daily living and that it may produce greater improvements in measures of stroke severity, such as in the NIH stroke scale than placebo. And this has been uh, translated into guidelines in a number of countries, and we see that in the German stroke guideline, it's recommended that it, it should be used started as quickly as possible, used intravenously, and that there was a uh, recommendation grade B, strong consensus for this. Similar, similarly, the European uh, guideline found sufficient evidence to recommend cerebral lysine in moderate to severe cases as an add-on to standard rehabilitation when initiated in the first seven days following acute ischemic stroke. And interestingly, they also highlighted the fact that this may be a particularly good treatment for more severe cases, as we highlighted before with an NIH score The Lancet group, this is including uh, Kathy Stenier, um, and a group reviewed the literature and similarly said that if the CARS trial was the only positive trial, um, when initiated within 72 hours. So what about other treatments that we might consider pharmacologically? Well, um, as many of you may know, there's been some research on the use of serotonin-specific reactive inhibitors, such as um, serotonin, uh, such as fluoxetine, and there's co conflicting evidence about whether these may improve motor function. Um, uh, and it seems that there may be uh, some improvement when combined with a transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation. And other studies have suggested that they may not have a difference in efficacy when compared for muscle strength. So, in essence, there may be something to enhance recovery for uh, the, the antidepressants or SSRIs, but it's not conclusive. Similarly, when we look at levodopa, few, free, frequently used for Parkinson's, and there's some small studies that suggest that it may improve motor function when compared to placebo, but it doesn't seem to improve strength or dexterity. And similarly, stimulants like dexamphetamine or methylphenidine um, combined with dual transcranial direct current stimulation may be beneficial for upper limb rehab. But the evidence is mixed regarding use of astorvastatin for upper limb rehab. So we can see that there are very few pharmaceutical approaches that can com be combined with effect. So let's go on to the third objective, which was just to make you aware of some of the online resources on how you can implement better upper extremity rehab. There are hundreds of randomized control trials, and it makes it very hard to follow the evidence. And so we're, we're going to give you um, some hints on how you might be able to provide a better set of rehab for somebody with upper extremity impairment. Why should you do this? Well, this is a really nice done study by Nick Ward, where they took people over 18 months following stroke and gave them a comprehensive program that included robotics, 
You know, you should do this or you should do that. So a group, an international expert panel um, got together and created this via therapy app in order to help people make some decisions about what to do. And as I suggested earlier, I would suggest you open up the app on your phone and go through this with me. So the first question is, based on our work with the SAFE model, was the onset of the stroke within the past 12 weeks? In this case, we're going to say yes, and then the question is, does the person have shoulder pain? We're going to say no. So, this is an, that, then it's going to ask you a series of questions that are mimicking the SAFE model. Can the person produce any voluntary muscle activity in the affected upper limb? The answer would be yes in this case. In a seated position, can the person abduct their shoulder against gravity and produce any elbow extension without gravity? Let's say yes for this. And now with the forearm prone on a table, can the fingers extend three times within a minute? In this case, the patient could not do that. So when you enter these in, the app will then deliver to you the treatments that are important for this patient. It gives you a description of the typical patient. So this patient does not yet demonstrate functional finger and wrist movements, but further recovery of hand function is possible. You can click on read more and find a bigger description of this population. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that the recommended treatments are 10 recommended treatments. And they're rated by the level of evidence. So strength uh, training, task specific, electrical stim. And they also uh, have a number uh, of icons uh, here. Uh, There's a star uh, rating, which is if you only have a limited amount of time, uh, which uh, ones would you do? Uh, so if you see four uh, stars, that means that you should do, that you should do this uh, first uh, over uh, the other treatments. It gives you the dose, and then it also has two icons, this group icon, and the other one that tells you, can this be done in a group, or can it be done alone or self-administered? And so you can see that these treatments, strength training can be done alone, as can that task specific. So, um, when you go into strength training, what you'll find is that it gives you more detailed information about how you do it. It will provide a video showing how you can do it, and it will show, show you the benefits of it, as well as the dose, whether it can be given in groups or self-administered. So, what about applying filters? So I want you to back out of the app a little bit to the page where you had the results that looked like this. And you're going to click on apply filters and you're going to see pop up some filters. What if I have a patient who has um, um, who, who, who uh, has impairment, and I want to provide them group therapy. So what this shows is that if I click on this, it then filters out all of the treatments that can be administered in a group. And you'll see that as you go through the app. So what about person with shoulder pain? Well, this shows what are the shoulder pain treatments, and you can see by clicking on the right-hand side at the top here, you're going to see that shoulder management is provided. So in conclusion, the SAFE model provides an easy to administer prognostic model which can be used to predict who's going to have good arm function and not. There are emerging prognostic biomarkers including cortical tract integrity, 
on MR diffusion in tensor imaging and transcranial magnetic stimulation evoke potentials, which can be used to predict who's going to do better. There's evidence of combining pharmacological therapies such as cerebral license and stimulants with technology and electrical stimulation with exercise therapy appears to enhance neuroplastic recovery. And there are hundreds of clinical trials to Many people can benefit from a more intensive and evidence-based therapy, and via therapy and evidence-based review are guidelines you can use. And this is some acknowledgments and some, again, giving you the list of the potential um, uh, references that you might use. Thank you very much for listening. Программа значительно улучшает прогнозы пациентов. Спасибо вам большое.